In the last month, our main attention has been mainly focused on the North Pacific and China, where two important operations were taking place. But with the end of those engagements, we now have to look south once again, where the decisive Operation Cartwheel was starting to take shape. In New Guinea, the drive to Salamaua was in full swing, as the forces of General Savige consolidated their positions in Mubo and Bob Dubi. And in the Solomons, the Japanese were planning to use their aircraft for another air operation, while the Americans planned their incoming New Georgia offensive. Looking west, there was also a shift in the Indian command and doctrine, which is going to be very important for the future. So join us as we delve into another exciting episode of the Pacific War. Nobody likes sponsors cutting into the video's flow, but a channel like ours can't survive without sponsors. At some point, we'd like to stop relying on the sponsors and present our videos sponsor-free to everyone. To do that, we need at least 10,000 YouTube channel members and patrons. Your kind support is always appreciated, we would not be able to create so many videos without you. Channel members and patrons get weekly exclusive videos, like our finished series on the Peloponnesian War, and the ongoing series on the Italian Wars of Unification, Risorgimento, as well as the Anabasis of Xenophon and the History of Prussia, as well as many interesting non-serialized videos. Our supporters also get our schedule, early access to the videos, access to our exclusive Discord, and much more. Thank you for supporting us. First, we have to talk about Operation Cartwheel. As we'll recall, the Pacific Military Conference carried out in March saw the approval of a broader offensive in the Southwest Pacific area, which involved a series of operations directed against Rabaul, like the spokes of a cartwheel. As it was expected to carry out offensives against Madang, the southern portion of Bougainville, Cape Gloucester, and the Kiriwina and Woodlark Islands in the year of 1943, the Southwest and South Pacific areas immediately began to plan their next moves. Although the original plan was to first secure the Kurowina and Woodlark Islands, and then capture the Huan Peninsula and Western New Britain, before continuing up the Solomons, Admiral Halsey would manage to convince General MacArthur to allow him to move against New Georgia simultaneously with the occupation of Woodlark and Kurowina. Thus, by the end of April, Operation Cartwheel was born with MacArthur incorporating Halsey's proposed changes into the revised plan. MacArthur also gave Halsey a relatively free hand, so the Navy immediately set out to plan the invasion of New Georgia, codenamed Operation Toenails. The Munda Bar ruled out a direct attack on Munda, and after a thorough reconnaissance of Kolombangara, the idea of bypassing Munda by attacking Villa was also discarded. Instead, an operation Halsey described to Nimitz as infiltration and staging four simultaneous landings would be made on June 30th. The main force assigned to Operation Toenails was General Hester's 43rd Division, although there were also other various units that would take part in the landings. Once again, Admiral Turner was in charge of the amphibious landings, with Admiral Fitch's grand total of 1,182 aircraft granting air cover, and with Admirals Ainsworth and Merrill providing naval support. On the other side, Admiral Kasaka and General Imamura also prepared to face the incoming American offensive. As we'll recall, it had been decided back in January that the Central Solomons were under the exclusive responsibility of the IJN. Yet the Bismarck Sea disaster would soon force a change of plans for the Japanese. As IJA units had suffered because of the ineptitude of the IJN, it was ultimately decided that both the Army and Navy would literally operate as one unit. Though the Central Solomons were still under the overall responsibility of the 8th Fleet, now commanded by Vice Admiral Baron Samajima Tomoshige, some IJA units would be placed under Navy command, according to agreements between Imamura and Kusaka. Thankfully, just like Halsey and MacArthur, Imamura and Kusaka would develop a deep friendship, so many army units would be sent to reinforce the New Georgia defenses. By late May, the bulk of the 229th Regiment had arrived at Munda, with the 13th Regiment doing the same at Villa by the end of June. Imamura would place both regiments under Major General Sasaki Noboru's Southeast Detachment, which reported directly to Samajima. 
Samajima's first orders were to arrange responsibilities between General Sasaki's Southeast Detachment and Admiral Ota's 8th Combined SNLF, with Sasaki in charge of Munda itself, while Ota had to defend the northern sector. If the situation demanded it, command would be unified under the senior officer in New Georgia, General Sasaki. Ota also had responsibility for coastal artillery defense, radio communications with the rear, and the all-important barge operations that would transport troops and supplies from Kolombangara and evacuate the sick and wounded. In the meantime, Admiral Koga, new commander of the combined fleet, had to preemptively send most of his forces home to support the planned reinforcement of Attu. With the fate of the Aleutian Island sealed by the end of May, Koga decided to concentrate the combined fleet at Truk to have it ready by August for a decisive battle with the US Navy. Without the aid of Koga's carriers, Kosaka decided to launch another air counteroffensive in the month of June, trying to prevent the Americans from invading the Central Solomons. While his G4M bombers were to repeat operations against American shipping east of San Cristobal and night missions over Guadalcanal, Kasaka planned to first gain control of the air with Operation SO, sending his total of 105 Zeros to sweep and bomb the enemy airfields with a new type of gasoline bomb. Having dealt with the Allied fighters, Operation SE was to immediately start, with 25 D3A dive bombers attacking the shipping in the Guadalcanal Tulagi area. Operation SO began on the morning of June 7th, with 81 Zeros under Lieutenant Commander Shindo Saburo attacking the Russells. Yet 104 Allied fighters were expecting them there, so they lost 9 Zeros and only inflicted 6 casualties. A second attack was sent on June 12, this time by 74 Zeros under Lieutenant Miano Zenjiro, but once again they suffered more losses than those inflicted. Claims were much higher though, so Kasaka decided to go ahead with Operation SE. On June 16th, the main attack was thus launched, with 24 D3As covered by 70 Zeros swinging south of the Russells to approach from the south. Yet they were once again intercepted by around 74 Allied fighters over Beaufort Bay, with the ensuing air battle rolling north over the mountainous spine of Guadalcanal. In result, the Japanese lost 15 Zeros and 13 D3As, only destroying 6 enemy fighters. Among the first-rate pilots who failed to return was Lieutenant Miyano, who had scored a total of 16 kills since the start of the war, so the Japanese were continuing to lose their most experienced airmen, something that severely affected the declining Japanese fighter performance. Furthermore, even though their formation had been disrupted by the Allied interception, the dive bombers pressed their attack and managed to hit two ships. Yet these were meagre results for such an exorbitant price, so Kasaka would have to urgently request reinforcements. The carrier Ryuho's bombers would be immediately sent to replace those lost in the operation, successfully arriving on July 2nd, but almost no more reinforcements would arrive before the end of the New Georgia campaign. Additionally, Japanese formations would never again appear over Guadalcanal in daylight, and the Americans assured their air superiority over the Solomons. Meanwhile, Generals MacArthur and Blamey had also been planning their New Guinea offensives as part of Operation Cartwheel. While MacArthur entrusted Lieutenant General Walter Kruger's Sixth Army with the invasion of the Woodlark and Kirawina Islands, a group of islands northeast of the Papuan coast that could allow the Allies to have air bases closer to Japanese targets in the Solomons and around Rabaul, Blamey had devised a plan to secure northeastern New Guinea. Blamey's main plan had two phases the first entailing the capture of Ley and the Markham Valley and its airfields, and the second exploitation around the coast to Finchchafen and Madang. To capture Ley, a seaborne landing would be necessary, and for that, Blamey reasoned that they would first have to seize a shore base within 60 miles of Ley. Nassau Bay was selected as the area most suited for the purpose, since its capture would also enable a junction to be made with General Savige's forces operating at Mubo. A beachhead at Nassau Bay could also greatly shorten the supply line for Allied troops fighting in the Salamaua region. To support the Nassau Bay landings, which were to be carried out by a regiment of Major General Horace Fuller's 41st Division, the 17th Brigade was to seize the high ground around Goodview Junction and Mount Tambu, and the ridges running down there from to the sea, so that the Australians could link up with the 15th Brigade at Bob Duby 
and the American landing force at Nassau. The doublet plan, with D-Day finally set for June 30th, was also to act as a feint, hoping to draw enemy reinforcements from Ley to Salamaua and expecting to draw attention away from the other operations that were due to take place on the islands of Kirwina, Woodlark and New Georgia. As we last saw in New Guinea, General Savige had sent his forces to carry out a limited offensive against the Japanese presence in Mubo and the Bob Dubi Ridge. With the enemy rapidly attempting to reinforce its defensive positions, Major Wharf had managed to lightly occupy the Bob Dubi Ridge, successfully luring Japanese resources away from Mubo and Ley, and inflicting many casualties on the invaders with his small, mobile and well-trained force of Australian commandos. But with the arrival of reinforcements, the Japanese counterattacked, and by the end of May, Major General Moria Chuichi's forces had expelled Wharf's commandos from the northern ridge. Meanwhile, Brigadier Moten had been attempting to subdue the Pimple position just east of Mubo, yet his efforts would all be in vain. From May 15th onwards, the 17th Brigade would thus concentrate more on aggressive patrolling in all sectors than on actual attacks, and by the end of the month, Savige would finally decide to relieve the exhausted 2nd 7th Battalion with the fresh 2nd 6th Battalion. The forward move of Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Wood's 2nd 6th began on May 27th, the day on which the 15th Brigade headquarters and the 1st Company of the 58th 59th Battalion arrived in Wau. On the other side, General Nakano had successfully brought enough reinforcements to defend Mubo, even launching a strong counterattack on May 9th that almost managed to break through towards the main Australian camp at Lababia Ridge. On May 23rd, with the arrival of two battalions of the recently landed 66th Regiment, Nakano then began to work out a plan for assembling supplies and ammunition in the Mubo area in preparation for another attack. His goal was to clear out Lababia Ridge as far as Guadagasal, thus securing Mubo and forcing the Australians to withdraw from Mazmat. Looking west, the 24th Battalion continued to defend from the Zenag and Bulwa airfields, as well as the entrance to the Bololo Valley from the Markham. On June 3rd, after a patrol skirmish near the river, it was discovered that Nakano had reoccupied Markham Point, which essentially forced Savige to keep the bulk of the 24th away from the action at Bob Duby and Mubo. From their camp at the bank of the Markham, Savige would further order that a small reconnaissance patrol from the 24th Battalion should go to the Nadzab area. On the night of June 14th, the river was crossed by a three-man patrol, which then moved northeast towards the village of Gabsonkek, where friendly natives informed them of the Japanese doings in the area. By June 18th, the Australians were back at their camp, with valuable information for the future operations against Nadzab and Ley. Additionally, the depleted 2nd 7th Independent Company was flown to Benabena on May 29th to reinforce the Australian position in the airfield, where 57 men of the 2nd 7th Battalion had been stationed since late January, and on June 8th, the 57th 60th Battalion was prepared to fly to the Marilinan airfield with the task of defending the Wetut Valley, where an airfield was being built. On June 2nd, Colonel Wood also completed the relief of the 2nd 7th, immediately sending a number of two-men patrols towards Nassau Bay to reconnoiter the area. Although the first patrol was discovered, suffering the loss of one of the scouts, the second patrol would manage to get to Nassau Bay by way of the Tabali River, successfully recommending that the area was suitable for land and road construction. Furthermore, in preparation for the American landings, the Australians built a footbridge over the Bitoy River and blazed a track up to the Bitoy Ridge. On Lababia Ridge, the main defensive positions were also withdrawn to a higher point, where it would be easier to counter another enemy attempt at encirclement. Only a platoon would be left forward, occupying a semicircle of listening posts south of the Pimple. Both this platoon and Wharf's commandos at Bob Duby would report considerable activity along the Komiatum Mubo track. This was Nakano's 66th Regiment, which was carrying forward its food and ammunition for the upcoming attack. In response, Savige ordered Brigadier Frank Hosking, who assumed command of the Bob Duby Ridge area, to harass the Japanese supply route. While the 58th 59th Battalion relieved the 2nd 3rd Independent Company at Hote, a party of Wharf's commandos was thus sent to strike at the Komiatum Mubo track. 
Yet the Australians would soon run into one of their own booby traps on June 16th, suffering a number of casualties. By June 20th, however, the party had established ambush positions in an area near Goodview Junction. They would successfully ambush three Japanese soldiers later in the day, killing them and capturing valuable documents about the arrival of the 66th Regiment. Yet Nakano's troops had already moved up close to Mubo on June 17th, and they would assemble in front of Lababia Ridge by June 19th. Nakano's attack was thus about to start. But now we have to move to India, where Marshal Wavell's forces still had to deal with the harsh consequences of the disastrous First Arakan Campaign. Wavell, who was soon to succeed Lord Linlithgow as the new Viceroy of India, knew the difficulties and dangers of using troops not fully trained for jungle warfare, but was still disappointed by their lack of skill and fighting spirit at Arakan. Therefore, he wanted to make full use of the next six months to improve physical fitness, train junior officers, adapt to jungle fighting, and mentally prepare troops to fully realize the importance of the CBI theater's contribution to the war effort in order to improve their fighting spirit. By the end of May, Major General Roland Richardson would also head an infantry committee at New Delhi to investigate the Arakan debacle. Richardson began by acknowledging that the troops' fighting spirit was fundamentally sound and that the major problems that affected combat performance were the overexpansion of the army in India, which forced them to give a rushed and inadequate basic training and made supplying the sheer number of recruits a problem. The low status and inferior pay of the infantry, which deprived them of skilled and well-educated recruits, the lack of specialized jungle training and collective training, the high command's inability to relieve frontline units with fresh, highly trained reserves, the lack of experienced leadership in battalions, and finally, the difficulties dealing with malaria and other tropical diseases. By far, however, the Infantry Committee noted that the most serious problem was the training and replacement systems. Yet these problems would not be tackled until June 20th, when General Claude Auchinleck was appointed as the new Commander-in-Chief India. Auchinleck was well respected by both British and Indian officers, so this was an inspired choice. One of his first decisions would be to oversee a changeover of senior frontline commanders and staff officers at GHQ India that primarily brought to the fore battle-experienced Indian Army officers, who understood the strengths and limitations of Indian troops, and the key importance of morale and hard intensive training in building combat effectiveness. As such, he also set out to improve the welfare, health and feeding of the army, to foster improved morale. One of the most important shifts in command would be the dismissal of the inefficient General Irwin, who would be replaced by General George Giffard as commander of the Eastern Army. Additionally, Major General Temple Gurdon was given responsibility for overseeing the reform of the training system and the development of doctrine. Thus, a strenuous effort was made to conduct intensive collective training under jungle conditions, in an effort to give commanders of all formations destined for Burma a chance at handling units at all levels, improving standards of staff work, practicing combined army tactics, and building team spirit. Furthermore, Auchinleck also initiated a policy of active patrolling at Assam and Arakan to gather intelligence, maintain touch with the Japanese, and establish moral superiority over the enemy, which paid dividends as it essentially allowed Indian patrols to be more effective. Although we'll continue to cover the reforms of the Indian Army in the future, next week we have to return to the Solomons and New Guinea to continue to cover the plans for the invasions of New Guinea, Kirawina and Woodlark, as well as to witness the start of the Japanese attack on Lababia Ridge. If you don't want to miss this episode, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content, Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.